Uh, today, we have a, uh, we're going to have a special guest, and let me just kind of tell you how we got here today. As you know, we've, we're in the middle of a, a series on 1 Thessalonians, and it's been outstanding. 11 weeks we've been in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I'll be honest, when I read 1 Thessalonians, I thought, well, this is going to be a tough book to teach because it seems like some of the themes are repetitive, but if you've been here and been a part of it, God is just doing so much and speaking so clearly through his word, and we're going to jump right back into 1 Thessalonians next week, but about six or eight weeks ago, I think Jonathan Craig and his, and his wife Susanna were here visiting from Jacksonville, and I was intrigued talking to Jonathan because Jonathan's occupation is he's a chaplain. He's a, he's a pastor, he's a preacher, but he's a chaplain in the military, and last week, and I meant to recognize our veterans last week, and we're going to do that today. Um, last week was Veterans Day, um, and so I'd like all our veterans in here just to stand up and just to recognize you. Come on, don't be ashamed. Stand up. Here we go. Come on. I know there's, yeah, there we go. Taylor Smith, what are you? Yo, you're, you're still active, all right? You stand up by yourself then, all right? Okay, so you're active. So give him a hand, all right? Active duty. Do a special hand, man. And, and we just appreciate our veterans and our military and our, and our police officers and all they do to protect us and our freedoms. And so when I, meeting Jonathan and just hearing about how he ministers to these guys in the military and goes on ships and, and spends time. And it's just an incredible, incredible ministry. And so I've asked him to come and share with us today. So I hope you'll open your hearts and your Bibles here as he shares with us from uh, God's Word. Been gone about half of our time there in Jacksonville, uh, ministering to sailors on the ships that are there in the basin in Mayport, Florida. So it's good to kind of come to our second home here in Bainbridge and get a little downtime to be with you. As we begin the sermon, I invite you to look on the back side of your handout. There's a, a brief sermon outline with a few questions for you to follow along with and, and answer along the way. And our passage this morning is going to be from Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Before we turn there and open God's word, let's take a moment to pray together. Almighty God, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge that we come before you not on our own merit not on our own goodness, but we come before you because of what Christ has done on our behalf, that he has torn the veil and given us access to the God of the universe. And we pray, Lord, that as we open your word, your spirit would move among us and open our eyes and our ears to hear the good news of the gospel and to grow in our faith in Christ. Lord, apart from you, we would be blind but you have given us life. And we ask, Lord, that as we pray together, you would receive our praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. I invite you to turn there in your Bibles or follow along uh, on the screen behind us. This is God's word to us. Paul writes... What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Amen. The movie A Few Good Men, a young Tom Cruise played the role of a Navy JAG officer, a lawyer in the military, and he was given the assignment to defend two Marines who had participated in the death of a fellow Marine 
and his job was to defend them. In the climactic scene of the movie, you may remember, Jack Nicholson plays one of the senior Marine Corps officers, and he says this line, you want the truth? You can't handle the truth. And what happens there is Tom Cruise, as the lawyer, catches him in a series of lies. In fact, he was the one who ordered the death of the young Marine, and so Tom Cruise catches him. And as a lawyer on the floor there, he comes together with this closing argument and lays out before all those present the key points to catch Jack Nicholson in his lies and to show that he is, in fact, the one who is guilty for the death of the Marine. Now, you've seen many other movies, I'm sure, or maybe you've even seen it live in court, a prosecutor laying out his closing argument in a case. That's exactly what Paul is doing here in this portion of the letter of, to the Romans. He is acting as a prosecutor, laying out the case against mankind, that all of us are guilty of sin. And in laying out this case, this closing argument against mankind, he destroys two lies that the world wants you to believe. And the first lie is this. Mankind is basically good. That's lie number one. Mankind is basically good. Lie number two is this. Mankind can earn his salvation. Mankind is basically good. Mankind can earn his salvation. And the big idea of this passage this morning is that all mankind is guilty of sin and is corrupt by nature and is spiritually dead. All mankind is guilty of sin, is corrupt by nature, and is spiritually dead. Now before we jump into the meat of the passage, let me catch you up to where we are in Romans chapter 3. The book of Romans was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, on his journeys. He wrote about the year 57 A.D., and he's writing from the city of Corinth, which is in modern-day Greece. And you'll know the letter to the Corinthian church as well, First and Second Corinthians. He's writing from Corinth to the church in Rome. And in the first 15 verses of chapter 1, you have the traditional opening of a letter. Greetings, introductions, sending his love to those in the Roman church. And then in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 1, Paul lays out the theme of Romans. So anytime you're reading Romans and you're kind of lost in the trees, and you're not sure exactly where Paul is going, always go back to chapter 1 verses 16 and 17. This is where Paul lays out concisely what he's going to talk about in the whole letter. And the theme of Romans is this, justification by faith alone. Now what does that word mean, justification? Justification is a, a legal term which can be described this way. God declares us righteous before him, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And we receive that by faith. So when Paul talks about the just shall live by faith, he's talking about us being justified or declared righteous before God, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf, and we receive that by faith. So Romans 1, 16 and 17, the theme of Romans, always go back there to lay the groundwork as you read through the letter of Romans. Now after Paul introduces this theme, he goes on to the first section of his letter <clears throat> where he talks about the universality of sin, the idea that sin covers all mankind. And he breaks down this portion of his letter in three sections. The first section, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32, he talks directly to the Gentiles, all right? He's talking to the Gentiles, and he says, Gentiles, you're guilty of sin. You can sum it up that way. After he talks to the Gentiles, he turns to the Jews in chapter 2, 1 through 3, 8. And he says, Jews, you are guilty of sin. He talks to the Gentiles. He talks to the Jews. And then we come to our passage this morning, chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, and he opens up full guns on everybody. And he says, all are guilty of sin and are corrupt by nature and are spiritually dead. So I want to examine right now the first lie that the world wants you to be believe, and it's the lie that mankind is basically good. And we see Paul lay this out in verses 9 through 18. If you have a Bible in front of you, you may notice that this section of Scripture is kind of offset 
from the normal uh, paragraphs that are set up in Scripture. And there's a reason it's laid out that way. Paul is quoting from a series of Old Testament passages, passages from a variety of sections in the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, and then the prophet Isaiah. And he quotes extensively from the Old Testament to show that this idea that mankind is in fact not basically good is not a new idea that Paul's come up with. This is an idea that has been taught from the Old Testament long ago. And he breaks down this Old Testament quote of passages in three sections. Look with me at verses 10 through 12 first. He quotes this, None is righteous, no not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. What Paul is talking about here is mankind's nature. Our nature and our natural state as human beings is one of corruption. And in theology we talk about the term original sin. Now original sin does not refer to the first sin that Adam and Eve uh, committed. It's often misunderstood that when we talk about original sin, that's what we're talking about. But that's not what the term original sin means. Original sin refers to mankind's nature. By nature, we are corrupted. We are evil and tainted by sin. And so you can think of it this way. The moment that you are born into the world, you're born DOA, dead on arrival, spiritually speaking. The moment you are born, you're born spiritually dead, dead on arrival. That's what we talk about when we talk about original sin. So Paul lays out in these first three verses, 10 through 12, the nature of mankind. <clears throat> now secondly, in verses 13 through 14, he addresses mankind's words or their use of words. So look at those verses with me. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. First he addresses our nature. Then he addresses our words. And then thirdly, you might be able to anticipate, he addresses our deeds, our nature, our words, and our deeds. So look at verses 15 through 18 where he addresses mankind's deeds. He says, Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now in verses 13 through 18, whereas in the first section of this quotation, he addresses original sin. Here in the next section, he addresses what we call actual sin. The sins that we commit. We lie. We steal. We gossip. We murder. So Paul does an all-encompassing sweep of who man is by addressing first our nature, then our words, and then our deeds. And it doesn't look good, does it? It doesn't look good. Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture... The doctrine that Paul is laying out is a doctrine that's called total depravity. A doctrine that's called total depravity. Now what is total depravity? Total depravity means two things. First, it means that corruption extends to every part of man's nature. There's not one aspect of who we are that is not touched by sin. And secondly, it means that there is no spiritual good that is good in relation to God. There's no spiritual good in the sinner at all, but only per perversion. There's no spiritual good in the sinner at all in relation to God, but only perversion. That's what total depravity means. Now let me make a distinction here between the term total depravity and the term utter depravity. When we talk about total depravity, we're not talking about utter depravity, which means you are as evil as you could be. Now, thank God that's not the case. He restrains in us our sin from becoming as, as great as it could be. So when we talk about total depravity, we're not talking about utter depravity, the, the fact that we could be as evil as we, as we could possibly be. But instead, we're talking about the idea that sin affects every single part of our nature. So you can think of it this way. Imagine a blood disease. You have a disease of the blood, no matter where you draw blood from in your body, whether you draw from your arm, your leg, your neck, wherever the case may be, that blood is going to be tainted by that disease. There's no way you can draw blood out that's not going to be tainted by that blood disease. That's what we talk about when we talk about total depravity. Every aspect of who we are 
is tainted by sin in some way. <clears throat> now that's the first doctrine Paul is laying out here with regards to mankind's nature, total depravity. The next thing that we see here is the idea of total inability. So we see total depravity and we also see this idea of total inability. And again, there are two things about total inability with regards to man's nature that we can understand. The first is that the unrenewed sinner, that is one who has not yet come into faith in Christ, cannot do any act, no matter how insignificant it might be, which fundamentally meets with God's approval or answers the demands of God's holy law. No unrenewed sinner can do anything to please God or to answer the demands of his law. And this includes the ability to believe, to have faith. That's the first thing about total inability. The second thing is that mankind cannot change his fundamental preference for sin and self to love for God, nor can he even make an approach to do that. So in a word... He is unable to do anything spiritually good in our natural state. All right? When we talk about mankind's nature, before we are regenerated and brought to life by Christ, we are unable to do anything to change our direction towards sin and self to love for God. So you can imagine this. If God is back here, by nature, mankind is doing this. We don't want anything to do with God. We're not concerned with what He wants for our lives. We're concerned with ourself. And our, our preference is for sin. Now, thanks be to God, God acts on our behalf, and he reaches in, and he changes a heart, so that then we begin to turn back this way and see, okay, I see where I'm going now. But in our natural state, we're heading away from God, and we're not concerned with what he wants with our lives. And this includes even the ability to believe and to have faith. So I want you to think about this illustration. Total inability describes man in this way. Some folks will say that mankind is on the top of the water out in the ocean, and he's splashing around, and he can't quite save himself, and Jesus is standing on the shore, and he throws a life ring. He says, all right, buddy, it's up to you to grab onto that life ring, and then I'll pull you in. That's not total inability, right? That leaves some ability on man's part to do something to save himself. But what happens in reality is that mankind by nature is a pile of bones on the bottom of the ocean. Has already died, has decayed, and is a pile of bones at the bottom of the sea. And Jesus is on the shore, and he jumps into the ocean and swims to the bottom and gets your bones and brings you up and breathes life into you. And you can see in that illustration that a dead man can do nothing. He does not have the ability to do anything to save himself. But it takes an act of God to initiate life in the sinner. <clears throat> so I want you to think about this. Do you understand the fearful state that sinners are in? That we are in before God does anything for us. The fearful state that we are in. That we deserve God's wrath for our sin. We have chosen to reject Him and move in our own direction. And God makes it clear that even the slightest sin is worthy of eternal damnation. It's a serious, serious place to be. So when we talk about this idea of man being basically good, which is a lie that the world tells us all the time. We see it on TV, we hear it on the radio, we watch it in the movies. Our culture wants you to believe that you are good and that there's something intrinsically great about who you are as an individual. Now, there are things that are great about us as individuals, of course, but we're talking about mankind's spiritual nature and his state in relation to God. So I want you to think about the weight and the heaviness of what Paul is saying here. He's saying that if God doesn't do anything on behalf of the sinner, we will continue in the path that we want, that we want to continue ourself towards ourself and towards sin, and unless God does something to change that, we will receive exactly what we want. And that's the result of sin. Now, the next thing that this should do for us, especially as believers, is that it ought to create an urgency in us, in some sense, and a desire to tell others about the seriousness of sin and then the solution to the seriousness of sin, which is the gospel of Christ, right? 
When we know those loved ones that are a part of our family, we know those friends that we've had since high school and longer who have rejected God, and we see the seriousness of that sin, it ought to create in us an urgency to tell them, not just about the good news of Christ, but also about the seriousness of sin. And that's an aspect that often is left out of the church in, in today's culture. There's a lack of talk about how serious sin is in relation to a holy God. Now, also for the believer, the reality of our natural spiritual state, when we read this from Paul's gospel, from Paul's letter to the Romans, it ought to cause us to well up with thanksgiving for what Christ has done on our behalf. When we see the serious state we were in, and that God acted on our behalf to bring us out of that state, you, you ought to begin to rise up and enjoy in thanksgiving, realizing how great the gospel is, that it reversed our trajectory towards hell and God's wrath and turned us towards him to receive life and joy and peace. So beware of those who would teach you or who would tell you that you are basically good by nature. It's not true. Paul makes it clear here. There's no arguing around what Paul has done in the first three chapters of Romans. He's laid out his closing argument over three chapters of Scripture that all mankind is guilty and is corrupt by nature and is spiritually dead. <clears throat> now we have to have an, uh, a right understanding of who we are as people in order to rightly understand salvation and to rightly understand the gospel. And this is where the second lie comes in that mankind can earn his salvation. Because if you believe the first lie, that mankind is basically good, you will believe the second lie, that you can earn your salvation. If you believe the first lie, you will believe the second lie. So let's take a look a little bit more closely at lie number two, that mankind can earn salvation. And this comes from verses 19 and 20. As we've read already up to this point, you can see that contrary to earning salvation, mankind actually earns condemnation. The wages of sin is death. That's what we earn in our natural state. We're racking it up. We're good at piling up condemnation. We cannot earn salvation. So take a look at verses 19 and 20. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now in verse 19, Paul answers this question to himself, but we might ask, well, who's under the law? And he makes it clear that every mouth and the whole world is under the law. And Paul even says in chapter 2, verse, th verse 15, that God's law is written on the hearts of men. So even if you've never read the Old Testament, God's law is written enough on the heart of man, enough to condemn him for his breaking it. Because there's no one who has not broken God's law. And this is the first use of the law of God. There are three uses of the law that we talk about. And the first use is that it acts like a mirror and shows us our sin. When I was in high school as a junior, one year for Christmas, I got a great leather jacket. I thought I was pretty cool wearing my leather jacket around school. Wore my leather jacket one day to school, had my favorite shoes on, some Adidas shell tops. And I thought I was looking pretty good walking through the hallways of school. Well, I was walking around feeling pretty hot. And then I stopped into the bathroom and I saw right smack in the middle of my forehead a huge pimple, the biggest, reddest pimple I'd ever seen. And immediately, the mirror did its job. It showed me who I really was, right? I wasn't the hot guy walking around the halls of the high school that I thought I was. I was a goofball with a big pimple in the middle of my forehead. But that's how the law acts for us. It's a mirror. It shows us who we really are. When we see God's law, we see, in fact, we cannot live up to what God requires of us. It acts as a mirror. That's the first use of the law. Now, the second use of the law is that not only does it act as a mirror to show us who we really are, but it drives us to Christ, right? We see who we really are, and we say, God, I cannot live up to your law. Where can I go? And the answer is that it ought to drive us to the cross because it is there that Christ satisfies God's law on our behalf. So that's the second use of the law. 
It acts as a mirror. It drives us to Christ. And then the third use of the law is that it sanctifies us or makes us holy, right? We see the law once we believe and we strive to live according to God's word. And so the Holy Spirit works through his word and in our lives to conform us to his image, to make us holier and holier just as God is holy. So those are the three uses of the law. And we see Paul laying out clearly here the use of the law in verse 19 is to show us as a mirror who we really are in relation to God. <clears throat> now in verse 20, Paul makes this statement that works of the law cannot justify. Remember, there's the theme. Paul's hitting it again, justification, that we are declared righteous before God, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf and we receive that by faith. But he says, works of the law cannot justify us. And we can see that it's clear that that's the case because we just read verses 9 through 18. When you read that passage, verses 9 through 18, it's clear that you cannot do anything to justify or make yourself righteous before God. It has to be done by somebody else, and we know who that somebody else is. And what's interesting about this verse in verse 20 is that Paul uses a specific Greek word. It's the Greek word sarx, but in your Bibles, you may see it translated a variety of ways. I'm reading from the ESV, and that's what's up here on the screen. They translate it the word human being. It's one word, but in English, they say human being. You may have a translation that says flesh, which is a, a word for word translation. The Greek word sarx can be translated exactly flesh. And whenever Paul or another writer of scripture most often uses this word sarx, he's not talking about our physical body. He's not talking about the fact that we have bones and meat and muscle and, and hair and all that sort of stuff. But what he's talking about is when he uses the word sarx, flesh, or in this case human being, he's talking about our fallen nature as men. He's talking about our fallen nature. So when he says in verse 20 that works of the law, by works of the law, no human being or no flesh will be justified before God, what he's saying is that no fallen man can do anything to make his fallen nature righteous before God. You can't live just right. You can't do enough good. You can't act any spiritually better than anyone else to get yourself right before God because, one, we don't want to in our natural state. We're concerned primarily with sin and self, and we have no concern for God in our natural state. We don't want to. And then secondly, we already saw, we don't have the ability to. We're a pile of bones on the bottom of the ocean as far as our spiritual nature is concerned to God. <clears throat> one of my best friends in college called me one day after I had moved away from our college town. I actually crossed over here in Valdosta, is where I went to school. And he called me after I'd moved away one day, and we began to talk about the gospel. And I began to explain to him what Christ had done on behalf of sinners. And he said this to me. <clears throat> he said, Jonathan, I don't want somebody else to do it for me. I want to do it for myself. Now, that's a, a, a thought that many of us have, right? I don't want anybody else to do it for me. I want to do it by myself, especially in our American culture. Our American culture is very independent. Fiercely independent. We don't want to accept help from others. So our culture ingrains in us this idea that we've got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and do it for yourself. Now, that applies in many aspects of life. But as far as our relationship to God goes, it has no application whatsoever. And you can see that in his statement, he didn't understand the serious state of his nature as a sinner before God. He thought that he had something in him that would enable him to do something right or to do something good in relation to God in order to bring him in a right relationship with him. And we see this throughout the proliferation of world religions in our societies and in our world. Religions want you to do something to get yourself right with God. So, for example, Hinduism teaches that you have to be reincarnated so many times until you get it right. And then once you get it right, finally on that life, you'll be in a right relationship with the gods. Or if you offer sacrifices enough, we see this in the Old Testament cults. If you offer the right sacrifice to appease the gods, then you're in a right relationship with him. Or maybe Islam tells you that you have to follow the five pillars of Islam just right. And if you do those five things, then you'll be in a right relationship with God. Or Buddhism tells you that you have to achieve nirvana. And if you are able to achieve that perfect state, then you have risen and, and you're in a right relationship with God. Or maybe even the health and wealth gospel 
which has penetrated into the Christian church throughout the West, that if you have enough faith, you'll be healthy and you'll be wealthy and you'll be in a right relationship with God. And even in the guise of Christianity, many people will use Christianity as a way to try their, to show that they can earn themselves into heaven. They can earn that salvation to get them right before God. I go to church every single time that the church doors are open. I give enough money, and that's going to put me in a right relationship with God. I went on this mission trip and that mission trip, and so I'm creating this resume of all the good things that I've done in order to earn my salvation before God. But Paul makes it clear here, and Scripture does elsewhere, that even the smallest sin is worthy of eternal damnation. So I want you to think of it this way. We all love football in this part of the country. With, if you have the ball and you're on the field and you step one pinky toe out of bounds, what? The play is over. It doesn't matter if you're all the way out of bounds or if just your toenail touches out of bounds. The play is dead. The same is true with God's law. If you have done one thing, no matter how small it is to break God's law, we deserve eternal wrath because of our disobedience towards God. And so there's nothing that we can do intrinsically in and of ourselves to set ourselves right before God. So this ought to cause us to look in at ourselves right now as we read this passage and ask ourselves the question, am I trying to set myself up right before God? Is there something that I can do? Am I I'm trying to do just good enough to make myself righteous before God? Maybe it is the case that that's where you are this morning, that you're trying to do good enough to put yourself right before God. Well, let me make it clear, if Paul hasn't made it clear enough, you can't. There's nothing that you can do on your own accord to set you right with God. And trying to do so is going to burn you out, It results in despair, and it's an exercise in futility because it's not something that can be accomplished. And even if you could set yourself right before God, even if you could, then Christ's life and his death and his resurrection were a waste. What was he doing if we can set ourselves right before God? There was no reason for him to do any of that If you had something, nothing you, to set yourself up right before God, he was a fool if that was the case. But Paul makes it clear, and Scripture makes it clear, that there's not anything that we can do to set ourselves right before God. And that's why Christ lived perfectly. And that's why he died in your place. And that's why he rose and conquered the grave. Because we were in a serious state, and he did something to change it. Now, one of the things that this also ought to do for us is if we ask ourselves the question and if we're honest with ourselves, thinking that we might be able to earn salvation for God, we ought to acknowledge to the Lord, Lord, I acknowledge that this is the way that I've thought and the way that I believed. And I understand that there's nothing that I can do to set myself right before you. That's the first step. Confessing that there's been a misunderstanding in your sinfulness and in God's holiness. And if we do that, we are on the right step to move towards salvation because God has worked in us to bring about that statement. The other thing that ought to do for believers, for those of us who have accepted and trusted in Christ for salvation, it ought to make you realize it wasn't because of you. There was nothing that you did to get you there to make you better than somebody else. You weren't holier than that person. And you weren't smarter than that person because you learned a little bit more. There was nothing that was intrinsically special about you to bring you to faith in Christ. It was all God's action on your behalf. So there ought to be no room for pride and no room for boasting about, well, (laughs) I'm saved and that guy over there is not because I'm so good or I'm so smart or I'm so holy. Paul will go on and elaborate that in Romans, that there's no room for boasting in the gospel of Christ, because it's Christ who has acted on our behalf. Now, there's another way that this also might show itself to you, and it's something similar to what I just mentioned, but if you're comparing yourself to somebody else, say, okay, well, I'm not as bad as that guy over there, or I'm really not as bad as that girl over there. What you're revealing about yourself is that you're setting up a standard of judgment that's according to your own nature, And not according to God's nature, right? And you're thinking that if I can just be a little bit better than the next guy or the next girl, then that's going to set me up in a right relationship with God. 
But the case has been made by Paul that when we look at God's law, there's not anything that can set us up right before him. Now, two things ought to be happening right now. The first is that you ought to be feeling the weight and the heaviness of your sin. Now, I've only talked about ten verses of what Paul's written here, but he's just written three chapters about this. So imagine continuing to spend another two hours walking through the rest of what Paul's already said about how serious our sin is. He's doing it on purpose. He's putting the weight and the pressure of our sin on us so that we feel it pressing down on us. And if you feel that weight of sin and you feel how serious it is before God, then it ought to, like we've already mentioned, cause us to ask the question, well, where do I go? Or to ask the question like those did in Acts as they heard Peter preach, what must we do then to be saved? That question ought to come to your mind when you feel the heaviness and the weight of sin. Where do we go? What must we do in order to be saved? And you know the answer. The answer is to go to Christ. Because Christ obeyed perfectly God's law on your behalf. You haven't done it. I haven't done it. No one has done it. So somebody had to do it. And God sent His Son to do that perfectly. He lived on your behalf. But He didn't just live on your behalf. He died on your behalf. Right? You deserved hell. And you deserved God's wrath. But God stepped in and said, He's going to send His Son. So that when He looks at us, when Christ dies for us, He sees Christ. And He sees Christ's righteousness and puts it on us. And He takes our sin and He throws it on Christ. It's the great exchange. We get what Christ has and He takes what we deserve. That's the gospel. He has lived and He has died and He has risen from the grave and conquered death so that we can know life. Now that's the first thing that it ought to do. You feel the weight of sin. And secondly, you ought to be rising up with thanksgiving for what Christ has done on your behalf. This is the week of Thanksgiving and you want something to thank God about? It's not your car. It's not your house. It's not the good food you're eating at the Thanksgiving table. We ought to thank Him for those things. But this is something to thank Jesus Christ for. This is something to thank God for, that He has done away with sin and death on our behalf and has brought us life and joy and peace in abundance. Now I want to close by doing this. I'm going to take this passage and I'm going to tweak it a little bit and read it this way. So listen closely to what Christ has done for us instead of how Paul writes it here. One is righteous. Yes, one. One understands. One seeks for God, who has not turned aside. His worth is beyond compare. One does good. Only one. His throat is a river of life. He uses his tongue to reveal truth. The words of life are under his lips. His mouth is full of blessings and joy. His feet were pierced to give life. In their path are victory and joy, and his way is the way of peace. Justification by faith alone in Christ alone. We have been declared righteous before God, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done on our behalf, and we receive that by faith. That is reason to give thanksgiving to God this week. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, we confess before you our sin this morning, that we are tainted by sin. And if it were not for your action on our behalf, we would be still in our dead and lost state. And we are grateful for Paul's words, as harsh as they are to us, to reveal the truth about our natural state. Your word is like a mirror to show us exactly who we are, so that by seeing our sin, we would run to Christ and to trust in him that he is who he said he was and that he has done exactly what he has set out to do to set sinners in a right relationship with God by living and dying in our place. It's in His holy name that we pray. Amen.